So, this is Data Manager, which is a way of managing your validation data, which is really your data, what people give to you. I'm Jay. So, in case you missed it, last year at Yapsi, Corey gave a talk on Data Verifier, and the inspiration for that was this is what forms look like now in a lot of websites, and it's bad because it's like, here's an error message on a form with 15 different field sets. Where is it actually at? This is better. You have it where each field set has an error message that says, hey, this scope is not right. So this is from Corey's talk last year, and it's just the getting started slide on data verifier. It's very simple. You say, create a new verifier object, verify the data that's coming in. If it's successful, everything's good. If it's not, you fail and you handle it. And data verifier is a very simple way of doing that. It uses most type constraints. Uh, so any type of strength that you have, including coercion, can happen. So you take in your form values from a web app, pass it in just as raw input, and from the results object, you can get coerced real objects out. So a good example of that is something like a date time. Let somebody put in a time, you use a coercion using like date time x easy, and the final result is a verified date. You combine that with moose types with additional coercion and say, well, in order for this to be valid, it has to be greater, the day has to be greater than today, or less than today. A third of my audience just left, so I'll wait. Not really. So, in the last year since we've been working on this, and we've been working on it a lot, uh, Data Verifier has had 10 different releases. Um, the Data Manager is one release since then. Was his talk that bad, or you just forgot something? Oh, you're I forgot happy. something in the PowerPoint. All right, well, you're good. Uh, the data manager is very simple. It's a glorified hash ref of stuff. You have data verifiers, and you have a message stack. That's all the data manager really is. So message stack is uh, pretty much the same, the parsing stuff, which you probably have never seen. What are you doing here? You're talking, sorry. What about Corey? Huh? What about Corey? Well, Corey's great and all, but I want to hear your talk. Corey's talk is better than my talk. Then why are you here? I was going to leave, and then they were like, no, I wanted to hear your talk. So, well, I'm here I'm too. Complicated. Bring it on. So, uh, message stack has separated out. Uh, not a lot has changed in message stack. The big change has been in data verifier and uh, data manager. So, now, what this has given us in our applications is very elegant handling of all the data that comes in from users and everything. Um, I don't think that we're at this perfect point where we deliver a great user experience, but we're getting there, we're getting very close, and it's gotten significantly better. Um, what's funny is that a lot of this core code hasn't changed in the last year. It's how we use it, and that's mostly what this talk is about. So, data manager example, we have this. You create a data manager object, you create a data verifier object, you set a verifier based on the scope, and that can be any name that you want, just however you're gonna use it. You verify, and when you verify, you can actually verify just a single scope, which is nothing different than just calling verify on the data verifier, or you can verify every scope that it has, and then it, it keeps track of success, and it also has a unified message stack. So if you verify three different scopes, the messages go into message stack under those scopes as well. So you can iterate over a message stack and get every message that you want to say, what are all the error messages? Or what are the error messages for a specific scope? So a scope is that, just keyword and everything. Can you see back there what it says? Okay. Uh, the, uh, the messages. Same thing, after you verify on a scope, you say, what are the messages for scope address? And it gives you back another message stack because message stack is recursive. So if you say, give me a message stack for errors, it returns a message stack of only those matching messages. The results is a data verifier results object that you get. Yeah. Uh, the nice thing about this is data manager, the messages, and the results are completely serializable because it doesn't store the coerced final value in data verify results. It will repopulate from the original text input that it got. 
So you don't have to worry about, oh, I can't serialize a date time object or a DBIC row. You just set up coercions to do what you want and you use that original text value. So if you do inflate it, you have that get original value. After you call verify, then you have coerced values. So it, it follows that same pattern. What that means is that you can serialize and actually save results. So you can have people create templates of form input, store those in a database somewhere, repopulate a form using those original values that they specified and not the coerced values, which then gives you another point of verification. So if you change the business rules later, you still have these original values that they put in and it no longer just assumes things are valid uh, because they did it in the past. So that helps out. So our priorities when we were building this and talking about it and looking over it, everything centers on the user experience. That's what we do this for. And nobody's going to get a good user experience. Uh, we're engineers, and unless you're working with Apple and a huge thing, you're not going to have a good user experience. And a lot of people don't like Apple's user experience because it's very subjective. So what you have is an ideal user experience where it works. And that's ultimately what people want. And it's the second point is reliability when they're using your application. Using a unified manager for handling all of your data gives you that. It says everything that you do is going to be reliable because it all works the same way and delivers a good user experience. But you have to make it easy for a developer to understand and use. So when you're building stuff using this, optimize for how it's going to be used, even if that means that the code behind the scenes sucks. And I'm going to show you some of that. So the first point, CRUD is a very common thing. You see a lot of that. There's uh, Catalyst Controller DBIC API and all of the stuff that you see in the form reflectors, they're all centered around CRUD, which works when you have one object. But when you have three objects on a page or four objects, now you can't really build a CRUD interface because, well, what are you creating? You're creating this virtual representation that's in an HTML form. So an application either has very simple forms and a lot of them, or you end up with kind of a bad user experience because nothing really makes sense and it may drop field values that you put in over here if you had a validation error over there. So when you have a view that has a bunch of different uh, verified or verification scopes, that's a good user experience because they can edit everything that's relevant on one page. Uh, so I don't really like CRUD for that. Behind the scenes, it's fantastic. Uh, visual representation of scope. Here's a very simple uh, screenshot of a registration form, just one section. This one section, however, is two different scopes. Email and name, that's person. That's going to be on a person record. You're not identifying anybody with that. When you identify somebody, that's with a password. So you have an identity scope. Those have different rules. Person object is a person. Identity scope is identity. Now on this one, we're copying that email address from person into identity. And so that's just a little hook in the controller that we use. Uh, but I could have another login field, and then that would be under the identity scope. And the way that we manage this easily is using nested parameters. Uh, we use Catalyst for our applications. Catalyst plugin, params, nested, I believe is what it's called. And anything that has a dot in the name will get broken out into a hash ref automatically. So you can say it's $C, rec, params, and get a hash ref that has everything in that scope. So if we call that person, we get person and then a hash reference with all of those values underneath there. Um, this stuff is all just conventional. It's not forced upon anything and it actually won't error out if you do it differently because a lot of times we end up going, oh, this interface doesn't work that way. We're going to have to build a custom interface. So when we do that, we usually talk to the data manager model directly with our own forms and we lose a lot of the, that optimized for use thing, but it works. So we heavily, heavily rely on uh, TT macros to make all of this stuff behave the same. Uh, this is our form template for just that section. It's big, but it, there's no markup really in there. What we do is we have a variable at the top that says context.scope, and that just says when you're looking at this conventional data, where are we at? We're at person. And then it looks at the, the name of that field, person.name, person.email. The next scope is identity. Uh, identity.secret, identity.confirm secret. Then uh, what it does here is looks at what's in the stash or the flash and says, okay, do I know anything? Are there error messages for this field, for this scope? Are there hints? Are there 
uh, positive error messages, like, hey, you picked a good password, good job. Uh, because it, it all just bases itself off of the scope. Um, and that scope is just that whatever's in the name field. So person.name, person.email that person. And so it'll uh, keep that in that final HTML form. So it'll say, like, angle bracket input name equals person dot whatever. Uh, but then it also uses that in all of the messaging and also to pull up the values for that. Um, and this has a, so it has stickiness where it will pull from the data verifier results if they're there. But you can pass in uh, defaults on our macros as well. Um, so, I don't know why I had that sign up there. Uh, so, on that form, when this renders with absolutely nothing, you get those error messages below. And if you put in bad information, you get contextual stuff uh, right out of that. And it's just markup. It's, it's verbose and pretty complex markup, but that's all that it really is. Um, the, uh, the macros make it very easy to work with, because we just say text field, select field, checkbox field, checkbox group, things like that, and it spits out the HTML. And I really like that because we can have a designer go, okay, well, here's how we want the form to look, and provide us with HTML, we just have to update macros. And the macros are actually broken up into several sub-macros. So when we render a label field, for example, we have a label macro. Uh, text area fields, that's another one. Um, we try to unify them as much as possible. They are very, very large. Uh, our macro file, uh, it, it reads easy. It's not anything that's really that challenging to read. Um, I've posted some of them up on Git. Nobody really gets that excited about them. People just kind of like copy and paste and move on. Uh, the, the whole thing is 288 lines of code right now uh, that has all of the different types of inputs that we want, some other convenient stuff. Um, so if anybody wants it, just let me know. I'm happy to just go. Here's the latest version of it uh, that we have. It's a single TT file. Uh, and just leans heavily on message stack and data verifier results, uh, which are essentially what data manager outputs. Um, so that's the end of talking about the user experience, uh, because that's the HTML part of it. The reliability part, uh, we don't want people to think, and by people I mean developers, you don't want developers to think about how to handle errors. Because if they think about it, that means that you've kind of messed up in, in your plan. If you have convention and a plan on how to do stuff, they don't have to think about it, therefore it happens. The users don't have the user interface shock of wondering where an error message is going to be at. Because nothing pisses me off more than when I'm on a web application and errors are handled differently between two screens. I want them to be the same on both. And usually that's because different programmers have different ideas for how to do it, and there's no set plan on how to do it. So if you have that plan, everything should work. You never have to say, oh, I'm sorry, we weren't able to show you errors that made sense. You may have to, but then you fix your plan. So you should never have to say it twice. <coughs> Reliability is a short one. So optimizing for use, and this is where I'm going to get into some pretty complex examples. Uh, you build all of this stuff and then you hide it in the closet and hope that it never comes out, but it's there. A good stereo system. Nobody sees all the guts that make it work because it's locked away in the cabinet. They just hear the sound. Um, so you write it behind a nice API. You try to make every unit of work as small as possible. So that way you can test it very well. You can write unit tests for all this stuff. We unit test all of our verification stuff out of web applications. We don't need to. Uh, the web application part is very, very simple because that's a controller that verifies stuff. It's very, very short. And we do uh, post after refresh. So this uses uh, Catalyst Action REST. So if there's a post request that comes in, we look at the data or the parameters, and then we verify on whatever our object is. If the results are success, or um, if they're not successful, we say, hey, that's a bad request. Don't do that. And we redirect back to the uh, create form on this. And if you're not doing post after redirect, you really, really should. It presents a much better experience for the user because they can hit reload appropriately. They can click the back arrow. They're not double posting. It's really nice to do that. So this is verification. <coughs> uh, and except for changing out the object name, that is exactly how it is in our application. I'll show you that later. 
um, to make Data Manager be all that it can be, you extend it. So in the different applications that we use it in, we extend Data Manager in different ways, with different methods. Uh, common ones are all valids, which says, give me a list of every field that you have seen and know about that is valid. And you can do that in, in a lot of different formats. And that's why it's not part of core data managers, because sometimes you want a, a flat hash, sometimes you want it where it's actually nested hash per scope. Sometimes you want to have like the field names joined by a period or something like that. Um, but it, it's very simple. We should probably just update the documentation and say, here's how you can extend it. Um, but we do stuff like uh, all the data for a scope, like all the, even if it's invalid. Um, the uh, hash ref, so of all the fields that it saw, um, key by scope, uh, anything that needs attention. So if it's an error, if it's in warning, um, there's a lot of different stuff that you can do there. Um, the second part of extending data manager is how you create that data manager object, how you populate the verifiers uh, by default. So you can very easily say, well, look at every class that my DDIX class model has seen. So every result source that's loaded, which is very easy because it gives you an API into that, then create a verifier and you can look through all the columns that it has and say, okay, well here is all the columns that are required that don't have a default value. And I'm gonna make those required in my data verifier. Now I don't like that because that takes too much trust on DBIC. And chances are your database definition is different than what you're exposing to your user. Uh, so I don't much like that. Uh, but you can also do this with all catalyst models. Uh, and the way that I've done that is, if you just call like $C model, it'll give you back, or models, it'll give you back a list of all model names. You can iterate over all of those. And you can do this after uh, application setup, or you can do it lazy on the first request in your model. And iterate over all of them. Put like a moose trade on there or something. Uh, and then you just check. Hey, does this, does this verify? Is this something that has a verifier attached to it? So then you get whatever that verifier is, get the catalyst model name, and then you add that into data manager. Um, there's kind of an endless way to combine this stuff. And again, I'll show you an application that this works on. So the complex example of usage that I've seen go wrong is checking uniqueness. Uh, uniqueness is, is this username taken? Now, a lot of people, they put that in their controller there. Like, okay, well, I'm going to check to see if that exists in the database. It does, and then they throw out an error. It says, hey, you've already used that username. But then what happens is that all of those form fields that they put out that were completely valid, now they got destroyed. So then you do that after the fact. And you verify everything, and then you have a little block of special code in your controller that's easy to miss if you have to debug. So putting that into your verifier makes sense. That's kind of what it's for. Uh, and, and we do that successfully. Uh, I do verifiers with either lazy build or default. Um, usually, nowadays, it's more uh, lazy build. So I just say that I have a verifier object, or attribute. Uh, everybody here know Boost enough to know what that means? Absolutely. I know you guys do. The two in the back. Um, so the, the issues with this is that if you're verifying an object, like on update, you have to filter that out because you don't want it to error and be like, that username is taken by you, because that doesn't make sense. Uh, so you have to be able to filter that out. Uh, that means that you have to be able to load yourself at least enough to, to ignore that. So a lot of times if you have some distant verifier, uh, usually a lot of reflectors do this, it doesn't have knowledge about that. Um, and so once you've been able to figure that out, then you come up with a solution like what I did. I don't think this is a very good idea. Nick should think that this is kind of neat. It's totally abusing this. Um, so the verifier is just a normal data verifier profile. And I'm just doing a single attribute name uh, that should be unique. The, it's a string. And then it has a post check, which says, once you've verified that it looks reasonable, now let's make sure that it is reasonable with post check. And this check unique method, it returns a sub, uh, and you pass in the parameter, so it's just a, a standard closure. But then I have this ID that gets passed into the builder. And in my verify method, 
And so this verify method is off of my object. So whatever the package is, uh, I have this verify method that proxies to data verifier. And this looks at whatever the builder is from the meta uh, attribute information, or the attributes meta information. I get what the builder is for that attribute. I call it and I pass in additional information. And then I just can say, okay, now verify this. Now you know what that ID is for myself. And it works out because down here, if I'm just saying package verify, like some model foo verify, that's not an instance. So it doesn't have an ID. So nothing gets passed in. If it does have the ID, then it goes ahead, gets passed in, and the verifier works. Uh, so, went the wrong way. So the check unique method, it, has a storage mechanism, which could be whatever you want, Mongo, uh, DDIC, we have this for both Mongo or DDIC. Uh, a a post-check closure gets a temporary results object. Uh, and so you can say get value, and in this case, it's name. So get the name value. If in the store we can find that name is uh, whatever the value is that's taken, so if it's J, for example, Record is not returned, return one. We're good. We've never seen that before. That's fine. Uh, if we do have an ID and the ID of the record is equal to the ID that we were passed in, it still is valid. That's us. We don't need to tell us that we can't be the same person. Uh, otherwise, it's taken. So then the post check will fail and the error is going to come back with invalid name, uh, out of data verifier. There is a better, less hacky, hinky way of doing this. Uh, I don't like it as much, but you can still do it. Uh, this is <coughs> the uh, check unique method. But then here, we have my ID is get value and then an ID field. And so it's gonna be pulling ID out of the data verifier profile itself. The rest of it's the same. So in here, I added that has ID field, and the default is gonna be just ID. And the check unique now uh, gets rid of that. But we have ID that's added into the profile. ID type string is not required. It can be there, it can. Uh, then when we verify, if we're blessed and we have an ID, then put it into the data that we're passing into the verify method. And so why do I like the first? Well, that's the one that I wrote the first time. Uh, even back there, you're still finding the builder. You're still saying, okay, well, how do I get at this attribute? Because it may be a blessed uh, object, which Moose has already done its magic to, or it may just be the normal undecorated package name. So you have to look at the meta class and go, what's the default scenario? So you have to do that with either one. Uh, I, I was planning on asking Stephen uh, what he thought about this. <laughs> Because I'm sure that he's like, what the hell? Why would you ever do that? Um, and he probably liked the second one. But uh, the, the way that it works is good. Uh, either one of these solutions works equally well. Um, if you can put something in the verification profile, then you should probably do that um, anyway, even if it's something that you're hard coding in. So an example is uh, like user ID on a record. Uh, you never want the user to be able to tell you what the user ID is, but you still want that in your data verifier profile. So you say, okay, well, I have a user ID that's attached to this profile, but then in your controller, wherever you're handling that, you say, well, the user ID is always the person who is logged in. You can't ever change that, because then eventually you will change that, and you add an admin level access or something that lets people toggle what the user ID is, and then you can handle that without messing with your verification code or anything like that. So. Before I move on to the next section, does it, this make sense enough to everybody? Inspired by my genius? So, the second part, and this is on that optimize for use thing, is roles. If you have an object like uh, media, for example, that could be a photo or that could be a video, and those could be combined in with roles. You could have media with photo, uh, or media with photos, have multiple photos that can get assembled and it spits out a slideshow, who knows. Um, now, each of those roles could have different attributes and a different verification profile. So we wanna be able to do that. We wanna be able to say, 
an object can have multiple verification. And that's uh, just the way that we found this stuff progressing. And the way that I look at it is that every role has one verifier that it can handle. I, you could do more than that, but then I found that it gets kind of confusing to actually debug and everything. If you just say that, okay, a role has a verification profile, move on from there, everything works, but you need something that can manage that. Ah. So, our original verify method, that just was based off of data verifier. It says, give me a data verifier and let's verify on that. So, now what you do is you say, well, let's create a new data manager object and pass in verifiers, which is from this uh, find verifiers method, and then verify. And this stuff, you can actually like say that. You don't have to have that every time you call verify. Uh, but it's easier for the sake of examples to do that every single time. Uh, so the find verifiers method, this gets into the, like, that's a lot of code to put on a slide, but uh, I'll walk you through it. So I go through the meta class of myself to get all the attributes that it knows about. So it'll walk and uh, get everything that's computed. So it says, okay, if the type constraint is data verifier, uh, continue, and if it has a default, this is where that default versus builder thing uh, kind of comes in at. So this is using default, which I changed that on the X, I shouldn't have. Um, so it looks at what's the attribute's name, what's the default value, and Again, this also passes in the parameters, so you can have like that dollar ID, and this still works. Um, and then here's just a little sanity check, because every verifier has underscore, and then the scope name. So if it's photos, it would be underscore photos, underscore verifier. That's the attribute name. And if it doesn't match that pattern, it just warns. It says, hey, you're, you're kind of violating convention here. I don't know what to do with this. I'm gonna let you figure it out with this nice little warning. Uh, it takes the name. Uh, of that center part, and this will totally break, but uh, we just, if we see that warning, we go in and fix it. Uh, and so it returns that hash reference with all the profiles in there. So that's all that that find verifiers method is. So, uh, oh, I did highlight this thing. So the final result out of that verify is you have a data manager object that has everything uh, all the verifiers listed in there. It's ready to verify. You get back the, the results of the data manager that um, if everything's valid, it doesn't really have much other than the, the properly coerced and managed values. If you have messages, those are all derived by stack, so you can figure out, or by scope, so you can figure out exactly what needs to change. Um, the, the thing that has kept this very easy to work with. So every time we have that rough edge case, we're like, ah, well, it's informal. We can go in and do this stuff by hand very easily. You can have custom verifiers in your data, like your global data manager object that, that does this correctly. Um, so the, the naming convention that we have is that if the role is called something, like package, like my app role something, the attribute is underscore something underscore verifier. So then when we get a something error, we know exactly where we need to look at. Um, and so we'll actually have stuff that's like underscore asset, underscore something, underscore something, underscore something, underscore server, underscore verifier. It's, it gets very long, but it still keeps us sane when three, four weeks later, we have to fix a bug. Um, and never say, well, I know that I'm going to be consumed by these things that do this. Unless you put in a requires, which you can't do for attributes, um, don't verify anything that's out of your scope, which means out of that role. So if that role doesn't have that attribute, don't verify it. Let something else verify it. If you follow those rules, nothing really happens. So following that, each role is a separate scope, completely and totally. It doesn't go outside of its own scope, it stays focused, it works, and visually, it doesn't matter because everything is just a form. Still is that same markup, it still uses those TT macros. And in our application, we have my app person, and we have a role right here with identity. And so we get this display with a single thing. Uh, so, I have 10 minutes. I love it when I'm like right on time. Uh, so I'm gonna show 
an application which not a lot of people have seen yet, but it uses all this. I tried to do 1044 by 768. I mean, it, it supposedly can do it, but I think you have to have a really low refresh rate. There it goes. Yeah, see, it wants to do like 60 hertz. Oh, that's fine. All right. So this is an application. The, uh, the first view of it here is for asset tracking. Uh, Corey and I built this application because everything out there doesn't really work. Uh, we needed a way to track our servers. We've been growing very quickly. Uh, there's nothing out there that really does this. So we needed to go like, what OS is this server running? Uh, you can track that in the Excel spreadsheet, which is what most people do. Um, and so instead we just built this application. So that's that form. So if you submit that form, it does everything as you would expect. And it's backwards from the way I I keep going to the other side of the screen, it's not doing anything. Right. So its name is Jarvis. Mostly because we didn't come up with any good name. So here is our data manager object. Uh, the, yeah. Can you set BG equals dark? Okay. What? It doesn't help too much, but thanks. Um, so we have some stuff that's scoped to result source, and that's a DBIC result source. And so when this is created, uh, you can say that a result source, um, or a scope, maps to a DBIC result source. So if we have a DBIC object person or a table uh, person, then we can uh, manage the communication back and forth. This actually handles uh, both Mongo and DBIC simultaneously, which I'll show you that in a second. Uh, we have this nested maps. Oh my God! Look at that nastiness. Isn't that awesome, dude? You do not realize how many anonymous lists it's making and how horrible that is performance-wise. Guarantee it. So you would use a for each? Or what would you do? Believe, believe it or not, it, if you could, if, yes. Because each time, you're, each time you're doing that, you're passing an anonymous list between the two. Mm -hmm. Between all, I mean, it's just... And I'm using the graph there. Yeah, I mean, it's... Wow, okay. It's real. Cool. <laughs> hey, look, it's there again. <laughs> Just to insult you. Wow. It performs well. Yeah, uh, cool. So, unsuccessful scopes, bad fields, uh, new from schema. So if we get a DBIC schema class, uh, we go through all the sources, we create a fake new result. Uh, if it's not a Moosey object, or if, rather it doesn't do meta, because we assume that anything that has meta is going to tell us what we want. Uh, if it does this verify role, then continue on, and then it gets a verifier for that. And this one is easy because that's a that's an object, um, and then we create that scope to result source method, and then we create our actual instance of the data manager. Your um, your um, next unless it's got meta just means it's not something you want to try verifying anyway. Right. Uh, Everything in there, and our DBIC stuff is actually just for uh, person and identity, and then a link to uh, an organization object which is stored in Mongo. Uh, so we use DBIC only for relational data that says this person belongs to this organization with this relational permission set. Everything else in this application is in Mongo. Uh, Did y'all ever consider using Kyokin? Yeah. 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 Okay. I, I tried. I threw it away. Really? It drove me insane. Yeah. I hate it. I, I absolutely hate it. I've talked to Stephen a lot about it. Okay. It's 
Um, I, I'll show you what I did. I actually wrote a, uh, I'm still kind of tweaking it a little bit, but a uh, Musex storage patch that lets you look at traits, so you can use Musex traits. Okay. And it still will pack all that stuff and inflate it correctly. Nice. And so I'm just storing that in Mongo. Yeah. It, it's much easier. I, I would imagine so. Uh, and there's a reason why we don't need anything that Kyoku has because we index everything in Solar in this application. Right. So there's, it's either a single document that we're working with or we are copying to Solar. Um, so extract default verification. This is that uh, that sample that I showed you from that slide that basically is that find verifiers. Once it finds a uh, uh, an attribute that it can use. Which this is a hash ref of them. Uh, it spits out another profile. Uh, so how that's used in Catalyst. The developer context instance. Uh, we create a new one. Make sure that we don't have anything. We actually update our uh, DBIC model so that there's an accessor data manager. So if any verification happens in each of those DBIC models, which are those edge cases, we've hidden away this complexity. So all you have to do in a result source thing is go back to your scheme and say, oh, data manager, set verifier, whatever I happen to be doing, verify and then die on failure. And then you have an exception handler in the app that says, oh, well, look at what's in data manager and hope that that's why we failed. If it's in there, fail like you do for any bad data or anything like that. Otherwise, handle an unexpected. Um, so the other thing is this Jarvis organization, which is just a plain Perl class. Uh, so that new for schema. And so classes is Jarvis organization. There's other classes that we verify, but not globally like that. Um, and then we extract the default verification. And I'll show you that object now. Looks like storage, because this is stored in there. And then verifier. This returns a uh, hash ref of verifiers, which is just keyed off of that, um, that package name as a scope, and then the verifier that it returns that. So it's a hash ref of that. If this had other roles, then it would uh, return a series of those role names and then the verifiers that are on there. And so build verifier, this is an example of that. This is for the specific class. This is Jarvis asset, that check unique method. Then we have verifiers. And then now we iterate through all of the, the meta that's attached to us. So if there's roles that were applied, and this gets populated with uh, NUSEX traits, so we don't know what roles are on there, and it's easier to just look at all the attributes. Um, it's a very brute force way of doing it, but it works well because it's kind of impervious to any changes that we'd make in the design. Uh, the, uh, so it goes through. And it looks at all of the the roles that are applied, or the attributes that are applied from the various roles, and it adds it to that hash reference. So the hash reference is like asset, server, a, a bunch of others, and then the data verifier. And that's how data manager is populated. So when we are doing something in our Catalyst application, So we have a uh, cleanup user input that's just more convention. So if we have anything that we need to make sure is in there, like organization ID, um, right there. Normally I would put it there. I don't actually know why I did. Um, the results here, we verify. Jarvis asset, verify. The type is based off of the, uh, the type constraints. So if the object is not blessed, you have to tell it, like, these are the types that I am going to. And then it will look at the the various roles, attributes, um, it does that on the fly. And if it's not the same, uh, that that's actually debugging on my part. Um, we have a plugin that will serialize the data manager between requests. 
Um, I'll show you that in a second. So if that didn't work, we redirect, we log the activity that it failed, and we stop. Then we get all valids. Um, this is one edge case here. I wanted to have something that, if it wasn't provided by the user, to have a default. And Data Verifier doesn't do that right now. And Corey thinks that it's done, but it should. I'm not, I don't really disagree with him. Having this like verifier that populates data isn't a verifier anymore. Um, so we do that in the controller. Where if they don't create this asset tag, then we just say tag, and then whatever is this next sequence. Um, so fields is that all valids. We populate the organization ID, the asset tag, we create it, we store it, and we update our search index. And here's that get original value thing. Those are uh, writable fields. And when I was saying that you can save what a user has done and use that later, that's what this is. So when you're creating an asset, we give you an option that says, you're gonna save this, do you wanna also add a similar asset? So you click that button, it gives you another field with all of the same data in there except for name, asset tag, and serial number. Those get cleared away. Um, and again, the, the plugin actually does that. I, I'm, I was debugging the plugin and haven't taken that out. So. Uh, then that's all that is needed for that. And I'll actually walk you through creating something. So. So you add an asset in here, web server zero one. So web server, we have Debbie Linux. Okay, so now here are the types that get added in. Each one of those is a role, and we have a little formula that says, well, purchase is exclusive with lease. And it actually looks at the, the definition in that. So if, if you say excludes this role, then they get presented in a, uh, a radio group. This one, however, doesn't, it doesn't have any attributes on it. It's just, it gets marked that you're using it. Um, and so then here's that save and add similar button. Click that. It's that damn map. I told you. Actually, it's the solar VM that is timing up. Yeah, solar is slow. Um, I have a solar VM on here, and it's it's not doing well. Is it I.O. bound? Is it? Uh, it's virtual box being a pain in the ass. It says that it's running and it just stops responding when I put my laptop to sleep. It doesn't wake back up again. Okay. So I would go in and manually pause it before putting your laptop to sleep. Yeah, but I always forget. There we go. Are you listening? Uh -huh. There it goes. So, so uh, okay, so we have the name, the serial number, and the asset tag that is cleared out. That last asset tag was 100. So if I add that, it says asset tags must be unique. Now, we took a judgment decision here on if it's invalid, we still keep it. We do not clear away what you put in. Oh, yeah, because those tags could be super fucking long. It could just be like one letter off. Right. Shit, to type all that in. That's exactly why. Now, we've made that decision across everything. Because if something is invalid in one place and it doesn't disappear, we don't want it to be invalid anywhere else. Yeah. And 
when you tab through fields, it highlights it. Yeah. Because web browsers make this stuff easy for you. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're that's what most people are gonna do. Um, and so that's one of those user experience decisions that, that we've made and in the macro that does that. Um, we just look at it. Is there a value that's that's been passed in that the user gave to us? Because let's just try to put that back in, even if it's invalid. And it is escape so that it won't uh, exploit anything. And the message is just those red things that come up. You'll, you'll get the crummy value back in the gray box and a sideline saying you're... Yeah. You're and this is using uh, Kettle's plugin uh, I18N. So the actual error string is um, invalid underscore asset underscore tag. And then we have a internationalization PF file. Or right. And so we can put in helpful text that's in there. Uh, the, the nice thing here, and to make it easier, is web server zero. Oops. So you can leave that one blank. Um, and so if you add it, this is a message that's in there. So all that is is just a successful message that says, leaving this field blank will generate a sequential number. So if we go back to, actually, so here is our data table. We have that add similar. This re-verifies what it had in the database and populates the form with it in the same fashion. So it's just data verifier results and it sticks that in the form. Um, so if we have zero two, we can leave the asset tag blank, and it just increments it with zero zero one, and that's a counter that is based off of the organization, just in a bucket. So it doesn't have any knowledge about. Well, the last one you put in was one hundred, so we're going to go from one hundred and one because we're not that smart. I think it really matters. Um, so the form macro is we have like pretty date. Uh, this is the label field. You can complain to Corey about using tables. <laughs> he got really angry and was like, I, I can't get this to work the way that I wanted to, I'm just going to use tables. <laughs> uh, so you can yell at him for that. I was like, wow, I'm going to show that. <laughs> uh, well, that's not even right. It's not even closing the, uh, the PR there. Oh, never mind. Oh, I know. Um, so we have a read-only field that's in there, right here. Uh, select fields. It really is. That's why we hide all this stuff. So the text field macro, uh, if there's not a value, and results, which is stored in the stash, and that's what our plugin uh, does, is it just says, does the data manager, C model data manager, does it have results or a message stack? It sticks it in the flash, and before uh, execute, it puts those back in the stash um, and pre-populates the data manager object with that. Uh, so if we know about a scope, we substitute the value name. So if it's like person dot whatever, uh, then you get the whatever out of this. And then it gets the original value uh, out of that. So that original value is... Uh, what the user put in. You could, at this point, make sure that it's also valid. So you can cross-reference with the messages. And so here we say, if we have messages for scope, person, for subject, whatever the name is of that field, uh, first, message.id. Um, on another application where we clear out on invalid, uh, we put this line above and uh, clear out the value. So that's just how we've implemented it. Uh, we copy this file around to pretty much all of our projects that we work on. And when it gets some new addition, then I, I merge them all together. So we have, I want to say, five different applications that use this file. And I just keep the best bits. So when some good idea comes up in one of them, the other applications get it. And not once has it ever like clobbered anything that the other applications have, have had in there. So it works well. Um, the other, and this is like completely off subject now. I'm not giving a TT talk. Uh, so you can pre-process 
stuff, and that's a site shared base and the set of your wrapper and everything. Uh, so here we have those macros are, are done. Uh, but we set up a lot of stuff on our page. Uh, if you set page in your controller actions in Stash, then this doesn't do anything, otherwise it just creates another one. Um, we have the style sheets in there, uh, the scripts, body scripts, everything like that. And then at the very end, it processes that site, global.tt. Um, and so this gets pre-processed, it actually gets cached very well. Um, we can do a lot of requests per second with this uh, with this setup right here. Um, so this is how we use data manager and all that. Any questions? So I'm done talking. All right, you done talking. Um, very simply, does do people use this for taint checking? It, as far as like Perl's interpretation of taint checking goes, it, it's not going to. Um, you could put a filter in Data Verifier and do what they recommend to do taint checking, and that would work just fine. Um, we don't do it. I, I think that that's kind of a red herring. Um, we like Data Verifier uses moose types and everything, so it's like it's a string um, or it's something else, and we verify that it's that, we make sure that it has characters that we expect. Um, we did that in post check. So, uh, for example, if you're going to allow somebody to put HTML in, um, you can run that through like HTML scrubber as a post check um, to make sure that it doesn't have anything. Or you can run it through a filter that is an HTML scrubber filter and it gets rid of all of that so that it still verifies correctly. So, and seeing green things flying around. <laughs> Let's go back. It knows um, to expect this or that uh, server or whatever you're trying to verify because you have a database of those terms somewhere and it's just looking up. No, when the application starts up, it uh, basically finds all the uh, roles that exist and it processes them. So the, the application doesn't start up all that quick. I mean, it still is. Pretty fast. I don't think it's any worse than Catalyst. Startup is by default. Um, so it, it loads every class that it encounters, uh, looks at the exclusions, and it builds a big data structure that says, well, this class can be combined with this stuff. Uh, the whole goal here is that we're going to be able to arbitrarily define classes at runtime, import those in, and uh, that combination of like subtypes, like purchased or leased, those are exclusive. Uh, you'll be able to add however many in. Because we don't really know what it, uh, what we're going to need or what people in the future are going to need. And we have other ideas for this application, but uh, it's far too early to talk about that. 